acted on a certain kind of religious metaphysics. Um, I alluded to that before, the existence of God, the afterlife, free will also. Um, and Nietzsche thinks that um, that the that faith in the Judeo-Christian God, faith in the Judeo-Christian metaphysics um, is the linchpin that's under uh, underwritten and held together the moral system of values for the last maybe 2,000 years. And the problem is that now, um, while that faith and that metaphysics may have been well suited to, uh, to a nomadic tribe in the Middle East a couple thousand years ago, um, under a modern in a modern scientific age, um, it can't be sustained. And that metaphysical underpinning of this system of values is now, for us, really worse than useless. Um, so this loss of faith in God, the loss of faith in another world, a non-empirical afterlife, world in itself, superior, independent from, and superior to the ordinary empirical world of science that we all live in. Um, the loss of faith in that metaphysics is in the process of undermining our commitment to morality, that system of making evaluations. And in the end, I think, Nietzsche's problem, Nietzsche's project is to diagnose that collapse and struggle to find a way to affirm values not based, not moral values, values not based on that collapsing metaphysics that will allow us to avoid nihilism. If our system of values over the last, say, 2,000 years has been primarily the moral system of values, and that's been dependent on a metaphysical picture that we no longer can accept, well, the, the risk is that those values will collapse. We, we will unmask them, see that they are false, and not have anything to put in place. Um, so, so Nietzsche, as I say, yeah, Nietzsche's project is to diagnose this um, transition and try to find some source of value that can be affirmed even in the face of collapsing moral systems. Um, one more point about this. Um, the explanation for the collapse of the Judeo-Christian metaphysics of morals um, for Nietzsche is found sort of internally. So he's, he's, he, we'll see this in detail. Um, he thinks that the Judeo-Christian uh, system of evaluation, the, the Judeo-Christian faith, has given rise to what he calls the will to truth. So the will to truth is something that comes out of this history. And the will to truth is what um, has generated recently uh, the commitment to a scientific picture of the world. Um, and that will to truth has now, recently, uh, kind of, Kant is important here, um, has undermined um, 
the metaphysical picture of um, what, what previously sustained those values, um, namely that the metaphysical faith itself. Um, okay. Questions about that? Okay, our store is not done. Um, in 1882, then, he published The Gay Science, um, and he added um, a final book, final chapter, um, to this five years, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, five years later. Um, and this was supposed to be um, uh, a, so this is the um, Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft. Like the joyful science or something like that. I mean, it was supposed to be an alternative to the what he thought of then as the drudgery of contemporary scholarship. I told you about this point. He had been more or less completely alienated from his uh, academic community, um, and this was supposed to be sort of joyful and affirming, finding a way to affirm values in the face of. I've been saying, the collapse of the moral system of value, valuation. Um, and it's here that we get the slogan maybe most closely associated with Nietzsche. I'm sure you've heard of uh, And it occurs in a few points in his writing, a few points in um, the gay science. Um, but to me, um, the by far most dramatic occurrence is in um, section 125. Um, so this is the section called Madman. So this is 125 as I'm going to end up. I've got to tell you, I find personally this passage just extremely moving. He says, have you not heard of that madman? who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace, and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, asked one. Did he lose his way like a child, asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, emigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. OK, so notice the audience here. These are like sophisticated city dwellers who are not, uh, not taken in by superstition. They don't believe in God. And they're laughing at this guy who is asking about God. The madman. Thus they yelled and laughed. What an idiot. The madman jumped into their midst, midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God? I'll tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How did we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? Backward, sideward? forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breadth of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What, uh, what was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe this blood off of us? What water is there to clean, clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? There's never been a greater deed, 
And whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto. So you should be thinking of this in terms of the values that I was talking about. Here the madman fell silent and looked at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern to the ground and it broke into pieces and went out. I've come too early, he said then. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than from the most distant stars, and yet they have done it themselves. Okay, so this death of God, this collapse of the Judeo-Christian worldview and the system of values, a moral system based on it, have collapsed. The underpinnings of it are now gone because we don't believe in that anymore. And yet, we're still working out the implications of that for the values that we affirm. We haven't yet seen we sophisticated intellectuals in the marketplace, who no longer believe in God, don't yet see the implications of this for what we value. Uh, and the danger is, this is what I just said before, the danger is that all of our values will collapse we will not find a basis for affirming anything of value once we see the implication of the death of God. The madman and Nietzsche are worried about this <laughs> uh, and um, are, uh, I want to say, hoping to find something that will be an affirmation of values that doesn't collapse in that way. So that's why, on the one hand, uh, this death of God is a hopeful act. Uh, as he says, whoever is born after us, for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than to all history hitherto. The values that we affirm after getting rid of this false metaphysical view and the values based on them uh, will move us into a new era of history based on proper values, based on true values. And yet, there's a serious risk that we're not going to pull it off, that we will collapse into nihilism since, as I say, moral values have been the one that, that has dominated our culture and civilization for roughly 2,000 years. It's also here in the science that we get another famous section. Um, in, this is called uh, The Greatest Weight. Um, this is down at the bottom of that page. This is in 341. We get a statement of what uh, is often referred to as the eternal recurrent. And what I want you to notice about this thought of the eternal recurrence is how Nietzsche frames it. So it's presented here as, well, as a kind of thought experiment. And so he says, look, look, look at the very first words here. He says, what if someday, so Imagine if, he's saying. Consider the possibility. What if, so it's a thought experiment. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest, 